morning everybody and uh, it's lovely to see you. Welcome to uh, worship at Blackburn Baptist Church this morning. Uh, thank you so much Alec for the lovely music as we've uh, been coming in enjoying that. It's such a privilege to be able to gather here this morning and to praise and worship our great God who we've got so much to be grateful to. And uh, what better way to do that than to join this morning in our first song as we listen to the words of people gathered together at the Royal Albert Hall singing to God be the glory and looking like they're really enjoying it as well. So uh, let's let's join in uh, in our hearts at least with uh, the words of this great hymn to God be the glory. Absolutely fantastic. Let's, let's come together in prayer now as we uh, reflect on the words we've just been hearing. Father God, we do want to give you the glory this morning because of all those great and wonderful things that you have done that that hymn celebrates. Lord, thank you that though we didn't deserve it, you've loved us. Loved us so much that you're prepared to send your one and only Son into this world to yield up his life as an atonement for sin. And Lord, that through what he's done, he has opened up that life gate 
so that we can go in. Thank you, Lord, that it's true that the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness, the freely available forgiveness that you offer us through that amazing price that Jesus paid for us on the cross. Lord, we want to give you the glory and the praise this morning. And Lord, we want through our lives for the earth to hear your voice and for that message of good news and hope and salvation to go out to those all around us as well. So Lord, be with us, we pray this morning, as we bring our praise and our offerings to you. Lord, be with us in our worship. Teach us and encourage us, we pray this morning, as we join together before you and as we listen to your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's join together now in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Just a few uh, notices to share this morning. And uh, first of all, I, I need to bring some sad news of the death yesterday of our brother and friend, Frank Thomas. Um, we want to remember Frank at this time and give thanks to the Lord for his long life of service and love for the Lord. And of course we want to remember Anne and the family at this sad time. So I'm sure we'll have more news shortly of things like funeral arrangements, but let's, let's be mindful and let's be prayerful and uplift Anne and the family before the Lord at this time. Other things to mention, um, we have our community room Zoom, as usual, at uh, one o'clock this afternoon. We hope it's not going to be too long now before we can meet in person and share fellowship here after the services. Uh, but for the moment, we continue with our community room Zoom at uh, one o'clock. Um, we also have coming up this, uh, this Tuesday, uh, the 8th of June at 7.30, our church members meeting, uh, which will be here at uh, Bethesda Chapel. And also we have our regular Zoom prayer meeting still on Thursday this week, uh, gathering together on Zoom there. So I think that's um, all I have to share, to way I've noticed, unless anyone's uh, got anything that I've obviously missed. And we're going to turn now to God's Word, uh, the Word of God that, that Frank loved. And we're going to turn, uh, for the last time for the moment, um, to the book of Luke. Uh, we're going to be starting a new series uh, next week, going through the months of June and July, um, that's in, going to be entitled Encouragement in Hard Times. It's got something that's very much appropriate at, at, this, at this point for us. But uh, today we're going to uh, finish off Luke chapter 7, and we're going to read now from Luke 7, uh, beginning at verse 36. So if you've got your Bibles, you might like to turn to it. Luke 7 verse 36. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, so he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume, and as she stood beside him, behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him, what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he cancelled the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt cancelled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? 
I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Well, that Bible reading is a story of forgiveness through the Saviour, Jesus. And it's a forgiveness, that, that forgiveness, that salvation, which was promised long, long ago. And God, as we know, always keeps his promises. And we're going to remember that in our next song that we're going to uh, join in with together. And although we can't sing at the moment, there's nothing to stop us standing up. There's nothing to stop us joining in. Uh, this song has some actions, which we're probably familiar with. So if you'd like to, you don't have to, but if you'd like to, please feel free to stand up and to join in, at least with your bodies, if not with your voices in this, uh, this song, as we sing and remember that God always keeps his promises.
I certainly do. Yes, it's great to remember as well, isn't it? God always keeps his promises. Well, God kept his promises, as we've already said, through the ages to send a Messiah, to send his king into the world, the one who would come and die to save us. And that's what we're going to be remembering now in our time of communion as we come to this uh, time together that Jesus commanded us to do um, so that we could remember him and all that he's done for us and all the ways in which he has fulfilled and kept God's promises through the ages to us. So we're coming to this communion table now, not because we have to, but because we may. And we're coming not because we're strong, but because we're weak and we need the Lord's help. We're coming not because we're somehow good in and of ourselves, and that gives us the right to come, but solely because we need the Lord's mercy and his help and his forgiveness. We come this morning because we love the Lord a little and we'd love to love him more. And we come because primarily he gave himself for us. He loved us so much, he was prepared to come and give himself for us. So we can come together in this communion service and meet the risen Christ, for we together are his body. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 of the institution of this Lord's Supper, where he says, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray together. Loving God, we praise and we thank you this morning for the love that you've shown to us in Jesus Christ. We thank you for his life and work, announcing the good news of the kingdom and demonstrating its power by lifting up the downtrodden, healing the sick, loving the loveless. Thank you that he perfectly fulfilled all of those promises of the coming Messiah and Saviour. We thank you for his sacrificial death upon the cross for the redemption of the world and for raising him to life again as a foretaste of the glory in which we shall all share. And we give you thanks now this morning for this bread and this wine, symbols of that transforming love. Send your Holy Spirit, we pray, to us today that we may be renewed into Jesus likeness and formed into his body. We pray for his name and his sake. Amen. So on that first evening as they were gathered on the Passover in the upper room, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his followers. So let us now take the bread. Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in memory of me. Let us take and eat the bread, remembering how much it cost Jesus to buy our freedom and forgiveness. In the same way he took the cup after supper and he said this cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood whenever you drink it do this in memory of me 
So now let us drink this wine together as a symbol of our oneness in him and let us be thankful. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home to yourself. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and forgiveness, and opened up the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life, and we who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights, give light to the world. Keep us firm, Lord, in the hope you've set before us, so that we can be free and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite Sir Jane to come now and to lead us in our time of prayer. Thank you, Jane. As we pray, please feel free to join in at the end of each section after Lord in your mercy with hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can meet together and bring our prayers to you today and you, as always, are ready to listen. We come before you in humility, knowing that we so often fall short of what you desire us to be. But we also know that in your love for us, you sent your one and only Son, Jesus, to take the penalty for all the things that we have thought, said or done that are contrary to your will for us. And he has opened the way for us to approach you and ask for your forgiveness. We are truly sorry for the times when we've let you down by our lack of compassion, a sharp word or an unkind thought or failing to respond to the prompts you give us to love and care for others in the way that you love and care for us. In your mercy, restore us and fill us with your Holy Spirit that we may be more like Jesus, who showed his unconditional love by dying for us and offering us new and everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy, in your prayer. Father, we bring you our prayers for the world, but we really don't know where to start. There is so much suffering in so many places, and such great inequality between the rich and the poor. We pray for the leaders of all nations, that they would make decisions to protect and enhance the lives of all their citizens. Where there are wars and conflict, may they seek peace. Where the basic necessities of life are lacking, may they use the country's wealth to bring relief to the poorest. We ask that the richer nations would pr prioritise their aid support for the developing world. And we think particularly of the vote in our own parliament tomorrow, that the decision to cut the aid budget would be reversed, so giving a positive lead to other nations. We pray too that ways could be found of sharing the COVID vaccine more <coughs> equitably across the globe. Lord, in your mercy. In your own prayers. We pray for our own country, Lord. We pray that you would give wisdom to the government as they seek to lead us safely out of the restrictions due to, due to the pandemic. Help us to be sensible in the way that we move about but not fearful, for we know that you are in control of all things, and your perfect love casts out all fear. We pray especially for all the churches in this land, 
as they take this opportunity to look at new ways of working, to be able to effectively reach out with the love of Jesus to those who know nothing of his love for them and won't know unless they are shown in words and action. Open the hearts of this nation again, Lord, that many may hear and respond. Lord, in your mercy, in our prayers. Finally, Father, we pray for ourselves. We thank you for each member of this fellowship and ask that you would enable each of us to draw closer to you and in so doing, draw closer to one another. We pray especially for those in particular need at this time. You know them each one by name and we lift them up to you for your healing power. We bring our dear sister Anne before you in her loss of Frank. Father, may she know your presence by her side, bringing her comfort and peace. We pray for her physical healing too, especially for her eyes that are causing her so much discomfort. Lord, please be with her and the rest of her family at this sad time. We pray for our church that you would lead us and guide us, praying especially for our members meeting on Tuesday as we come together to seek your will for ourselves and for the community in which you've placed us. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. we offer all our prayers in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Jane. Thank you very much. Well, let's uh, turn back now our thoughts to that passage that we read from uh, from Luke's Gospel, in chapter seven, verse thirty-six. Again, if you've got your Bibles to hand in front of you or on your phone or whatever, please do turn to it so you can uh, read as we go along. There's a story of a, a country who had a king who had suffered a lot from his subjects. They'd been particularly rebellious. And some of them had even taken up arms against him. But one day, the rebels surrendered their arms, threw themselves at his feet, and begged for mercy. And he pardoned them all. One of his advisers said to him, Didn't you say that every rebel should die? Yes, replied the king, but I see no rebels here. In our passage from Luke today, we see another forgiving king and the story of two rebels, one who sought and received forgiveness at the king's feet and one who saw no need to ask for it. Let's look at our passage again, verses 36 to 38 to start with. It's interesting and perhaps at first sight surprising to see Jesus dining at the house of a Pharisee, this man named Simon. As we look at verse 36, because we've seen Jesus, haven't we, as we've been going through Luke's Gospel, being highly critical of the Pharisees and their attitudes. But Jesus, it turns out, is just as comfortable eating with the religious leaders as he is with those at whose dinner tables the religious leaders would never be seen dead. See, no one is ever outside Jesus' interest and love, even those who are opposed to him. We don't know Simon's reason for inviting Jesus to come to dinner. Maybe he just wanted to be able to debate over dinner with a well-known rabbi. Maybe he genuinely wanted to hear and honestly evaluate Jesus' teaching for himself. Or maybe even he just wanted to provide some sort of entertainment for his other guests. We don't know. The menu isn't mentioned either. I wonder if it was um, chicken, mashed potatoes, peas and gravy. Well. Probably not, but that, that reminds us that many things about this dinner in first century Israel would have been different from a dinner party that we might be familiar with today. For one thing, they reclined on low couches at the table rather than sit as we would. And the homes of the day would have been different too. They would have been simple with lots of ventilation required for the hot, dry climate, no locks on the door. Many people have also suggested that it might not have been that unusual to have people attending the dinner like this who were not specifically invited. They wouldn't dine with the guests, 
But what they would do is come in and stand around the outside of the room listening to the conversation. So when we see in verses 37 and 38, the woman was present at the dinner and had access to Jesus with her jar of perfume. While that maybe seems very odd to us in our context, it was perhaps less surprising then. However, what she did was unusual, surprising, and probably downright embarrassing for Simon, the host. Into a setting with what we could imagine might be educated, polite conversation about matters of Jewish law, up to the table comes this sinful woman. And not only does she burst onto the scene, but she also starts crying at Jesus' feet, washing them with her tears, drying them with her hair, and anointing them with perfume. It's always good if we can put ourselves into a scene in the scriptures, in our imagination. Just do that and consider what the reactions might have been on the faces of Simon and his other guests at this point. Talk about a dinner party not going exactly to plan. We don't know who this woman was or what her sin was, except that it was something outward because it was obviously generally known. It says a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town. She was a woman of some notoriety. Perhaps it's deliberate that Luke doesn't name her. She doesn't have a name, just a label, a sinner. Someone who everyone looked down on and marginalised. Well, she may have been a sinner, but her actions give evidence that she knew she was a sinner and was repentant. We can't prove this from the Bible, but it's very possible that this woman had encountered Jesus before and knew what he offered to people like her. If we were to turn to the equivalence of the events described in Luke chapter 7, in Matthew's Gospel, we find there Jesus teaching, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That's Matthew 11, 28 and 29. Perhaps hearing those words or something like them, the woman had turned away from her sin and had trusted Jesus as her saviour. Or whether it was earlier or whether it was on this evening that we're reading about, as she listened to Jesus, certainly her tears, her humble attitude and her expensive gift of the perfume all spoke of a changed heart and gratitude for what she had been forgiven. The great news for all of us, no matter what we've done, no matter who we are, no matter what guilt we feel over our behaviour, no matter what others think of us, that same offer of forgiveness is available to us still if we come in repentance like this woman to Jesus. Have you done that? Will you do that? So we move on from the broad events of the party into what followed next and Jesus telling a parable and applying it to Simon, verses 39 to 47. The fact that Jesus doesn't doesn't put a stop to what the woman was doing seems to prove one thing to Simon, his host, who was probably looking on with disdain at this point. Simon thought, as we look at verse 39, that it proved that Jesus was not a prophet. As if he was, surely he would have known enough about this woman to send her away. Simon wonders this to himself rather than saying it aloud, making it all the more interesting that Jesus responds in the following verses to Simon's unspoken question. I wonder if Simon recognised the irony, because if, if Jesus knew what he, Simon, was thinking, didn't that offer the proof that Jesus really was a prophet? What we've seen in this story so far shows the contrast between Jesus and Simon in terms of how they respond to this sinful woman. Simon believes that the right thing to do is to distance himself from her, but Jesus did not do so. Rather, he moved towards her with his offer of forgiveness and acceptance. 
That's a great lesson to us on how we treat those upon whom the world looks down. However, it's a different contrast that Jesus draws out as he responds by telling a short parable to Simon. And this contrast is between the responses of the woman and of Simon to Jesus himself. In the parable, there are two debtors. Both have debts they couldn't pay, although of different sizes, and both are forgiven. But one of them was more grateful and loving as a result because they were so conscious of the great size of their debt. Jesus' point is that all of us are sinners in God's sight, in debt to him and unable to pay. Even though Simon thought himself to be holy, he was a sinner, just like the woman. The difference was that the woman knew the seriousness of her sin and so appreciated the greatness of her forgiveness, whereas Simon didn't recognise his sin and felt no need of forgiveness. These verses remind me a lot of how the prophet Nathan came to King David to tell him a parable which was then applied pointedly to David to convict him of his wrongdoing in committing adultery and murder. In a similar way, Jesus turns this parable clearly on Simon as he draws out its meaning further in verses 44 to 47. Jesus asks Simon in verse 44, do you see this woman? Simon thought Jesus couldn't see who the woman and who she really was. But in fact, it's Simon who can't see clearly. See, he misses the repentance and the love that are shining through this woman's actions. Even though Jesus was a guest in Simon's home, he was not an honoured guest. Simon had not even offered the basic courtesies of a welcome and foot washing that would have been traditional in those times. It was the sinful woman who had actually offered Jesus true hospitality through her loving actions, evidence of the greatness of her love, who had been forgiven much. I wonder who am I more like in my response to Jesus and to the seriousness of my sin? How big is your sense of sin? Has the thought of your sins ever brought you to tears like it did to this woman? Or do you feel that your sins, well, they aren't nearly as bad as other people's? If so, you're more like Simon the Pharisee. Sin is sin in the sight of God. It separates us from him and it's a debt we cannot pay, causing us to be condemned to death. But the good news is this. The Bible says God demonstrates his love for us, that while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. And it also says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's what this woman had done. She had placed her faith in Jesus and the story concludes in verses 48 to 50 with Jesus saying something that must have been so wonderful for her to hear in verse 48. Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. She knew this because of the word of the Lord, the word of Jesus to her, and so can we. We can know that assurance of sins forgiven through God's word and God's promises to us, those promises which we've already thought today never fail. We should be very clear that it wasn't the woman's good deeds towards Jesus that had brought her that forgiveness. Jesus makes that clear in the last verse, verse 50. Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. It was her faith in him that had saved her and her actions were simply evidence of the love that she had because of what Jesus had done in her life. It was a vivid illustration of what it says in Galatians chapter 5 verse 6 where it says the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Our actions and the love that they express should show the change that has already taken place in our hearts. Not for the first time, some of Jesus' hearers, the other guests, were shocked and offended by such a pronouncement of forgiveness. Verse 49, who is this 
who even forgives sins. It was only God, surely, who could forgive sins. True, but Jesus was and is God, and he did have that authority. And he proved it time and time again through his deeds, some of which we've read about in this chapter, like the healing of the centurion's servant, the raising from the dead the son of the widow from Nain. These were great miracles, proving beyond doubt Jesus' identity and authority as God. But actually, just as great and even more lasting a miracle is what we read about in these verses here and what Jesus did in this woman's life when her sins were forgiven and she was made a new person. This is something that would last into eternity. And that same miracle is available to you today. So in conclusion, let's consider how we may apply this passage to ourselves and our own lives. Let only any of us who feel we haven't much need for forgiveness from Jesus hear from him in this story that the one who has been forgiven little, loves little. Let any who feel their sins are too many or too great to forgive hear a reminder from this story of God's amazing grace and mercy to each individual. Let any of us whose hearts are overflowing with gratitude for God's grace and his forgiveness to us hear an invitation in this story to give back to God extravagantly in return. And let all of us in the church consider how we respond to people like the woman in this story. We are indeed a community of forgiven sinners, so we also need to be a community that forgives in its turn and that says to those on the margins, you are welcome here. Let's be that kind of people. Let's be that kind of church. People who know that no gift is too good for the one who has given us everything. A church that makes clear everyone is welcome at the dinner table when Jesus is our guest. The forgiveness offered by Jesus is so amazing, it should make our hearts sing with love like that woman's. Our emotions should be involved. And our last song encourages us to get excited about the forgiveness that we've received in Jesus and just be stunned as we consider its implications in our lives. It's, I get so excited, Lord, every time I realise I'm forgiven.
uh, join together as we come to the close of our service in the words of the grace, that grace, that forgiveness that Jesus offers us. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you.